There we go. My microphone is acting up. Jimmy, you need to get a MacBook, honestly. This thing of yours is not working. Anyway. No, 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 no MacBooks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking nonsense. So, 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 hi, everyone. I mean, we've already greeted. Um, I, think, I, think, I think a special greeting goes to Ryan, right? Because he's joining us for the first time. Uh, and thanks and welcome, Ryan. I was actually supposed to give you a ring before, but I mean, um, yes, my days are just like so hectic. Um, just to have a bit of a social chat to to sort of also uh, sensitize you to what we do here and all of that. But um, I, I, I thank you for 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 stepping up and uh, you know choosing to come and share your story with us. And I'm going to do a bit of an intro a bit later. Um, and, and obviously you can take us from there. So today is going to be a bit different, <clears throat> obviously. And I'm hoping that my audibility today is like the bomb. And don't be jealous. If it's like the bomb, just tell me. Tell me, Vincent, you sound like you're in the studio. <laughs> Are you by any chance also a music producer? <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, um, thanks for that, Nadja. It's, that's really given me a bit of confidence around my little gizmo. Um, little gizmo. <laughs> but um, having said that, the tradition is that we start with a bit of um, gratitude just to um, you know, get our energy focused into what we are doing. And um, maybe, maybe, maybe anyone who wants to share something. Sony, uh, by the way, um, Last week, uh, when Sony left the call, I think it was last week, um, we, you, you mentioned that you had lost two family members due to COVID, and I had no clue, and it slipped our mind, well, slipped you know, you know, my attention, because I wasn't aware. And I think, I think we did that quite uh, rapidly without really getting to understand. If you want to share a story, it's very pertinent, you know, so, but I mean, obviously share it in an inspirational way because I think uh, there's lots of positives uh, that can come out of grieving and, and mourning and all sorts of stuff. But yeah, if you can just take us through that, Tony, um, if you don't mind at all, and if, because I know I didn't prep you for this, but if you, if you, if you, if you, if you're still, you know, sensitive about it, I'll understand. But other than that, you're more than welcome to, to take us through. Yeah, no, um, it, it happened uh, that my, uh, please just hold on. Yeah, so, you know, you, you hear about these things, you read about this, uh, the numbers increasing and you see families um, having, being affected and all of that. But when it hits you, you start to read more about it. You start to feel it and you start to think, Honestly, is this happening? But, but the, the take out for us as a family from this is that um, because it was my mother-in-law and uh, my sister-in-law, same time, same day, few hours apart, different hospitals, but coming from the same house in the Western Cape. So yeah, it, it hit us so badly that we, um, but the, the positive thing is that it brings out a new way of life or a new way of work. And for those who are not familiar with the South African way of doing things, um, Ember, that here in SA, funerals are big thing. And Nadia. Oh, and Nadia, yes, 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 yes. So families are big things. It's family reunions. We wait for, for weeks to bury the loved one. But because of the, of the cause of death and the lockdown restrictions, we couldn't bury as a full family. And, uh, and, and so the, the positive thing is that we save a lot of money going forward because nobody is allowed to the household that is grieving, even on the day of the, of the funeral. So it was just the family members. And uh, it, um, yeah, it, it, we are, we are good with this going forward. And we don't all have to be in that place for a burial, which is a good thing because we are starting to be matured now and to understand that, uh, especially black families, uh, Amber, Ryan, and Nadia, 
black families will come in big numbers, hundreds, the uncles and aunties, the aunties of the uncles, the nieces, the nephews, Zanele, you know. And so, yes. <laughs> so this has brought a new way of life, which is, I love this. I love this because it just means that if you are three people in the family, the burial can take place within the, the three of you and uh, and life goes on no cooking for the and home. it saves a lot of time saves time it saves money it saves a lot of in and out people coming in to say oh no you know so there was nothing like that for the whole week which was a good thing so so going forward we are still we are going to do things like that although it is a it is a rude awakening to the black community that um we don't have to slaughter chickens, slaughter cattle, sheep, and everything. There was just nothing. It was just a family and a lunch and dinner for the family. And that's what, that was it. Sheep, uh, coffin, goes on the ground, no PA system, no marquee, no deck, nothing, zero value. So, so yeah, the, 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 the positive thing about it is that we are now starting to live a different way which is more economical, which is more lean, and, uh, and we are good with that, so, <laughs> which is more lean. So yeah, uh, we lost two people in the family. It's not a good thing, but um, I couldn't go down to, to the burial uh, just for safety reasons. And the family understands that we don't all have to be there. I mean, what am I bringing myself for what? So yes, uh, so that's what, that's what happened last week. Uh, the 20th, yeah, 20th of June, we buried both of them, Western Cape and Eastern Cape, and 21st of June, Sunday, life went on, everybody was like, okay, we're good to go with everything, and here we are. Cool. Is that what you so, wanted to hear, Vincent? Yes, that's it. Uh, so so what, what I heard is a very practical and positive uh, narrative around this whole thing. Um, but obviously, we are also sensitive to the fact that, you know, as a family, you're dealing with this thing um, from a personal level. Uh, and, and I mean, obviously, on this call, we can't really pretend to understand what that feels and looks like. Uh, but we can, we can certainly be compassionate as we are, I think, most of us. I mean, I see messages coming through here. Um, and certainly for my side, I'm deeply compassionate. And I hope uh, you guys go through um this 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 healing process and uh and 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 yeah and just uh connect better uh to the things that are ahead of you uh obviously keeping in our hearts and minds or in your hearts and minds uh those that have left and uh yeah i wish you the best and particularly uh your husband um because these are you know blood keen people so so yeah uh, but thanks for that uh Shoni. uh certainly appreciate it Right. No, then, thanks, uh, guys. Thanks. Good. Good stuff. Good stuff. Right. So, 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 Ryan. Ryan, I'm going to I'm going to do uh, a bit of a of an intro. <clears throat> um, um, yeah, I'm going to do a bit of an intro of, of Ryan, and, and then Ryan can then um, you know take us through his his story and his journey. And I said today we're going to do it a bit different in the sense that. Uh, we're not going to focus much on the interactions and all of that, but we're going to allow as much time as possible for Brian. I was also anticipating that Seppo Masoka joins us as well. Um, I think you remember Seppo Mbali, uh, the, the facilities guy. <laughs> yeah, he was meant to join us. I'm not sure what happened to him, but it's fine. Uh, we move on. Uh, but yeah, we just we just we just listen, we 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 hear, and obviously when it comes for time of interaction, we apply the necessary um, 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 sensitivity and compassion. Um, but 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 with that being said, uh, Ryan, um, I met through Shalene. Uh, we actually have not really met. We've just texted uh, each other over the last couple of days. There we go. We texted each other over the last couple of days just to get the logistics going and I apologize for my side. I mean, uh, uh, I, as I said earlier on, I try as much as possible to, to decentralize the platform and not make it about me so that when things 
uh, don't happen. It doesn't always have to, you know, come back to me, but somehow it just always comes back. So thank you very much for making the time to come and chat to us. And we hope to see you again in future, even if you're not talking, just a comment, you know, give uh, your inputs on some of the things that you generally get to talk about. Um, so yeah, Ryan, please uh, tell us your story um, and, and get us through what's in your mind and take your time. Uh, this is a very safe space. These people are crazy, but uh, um, uh, they're nice people as well. Uh, we behave. <laughs> so, so, so you certainly are safe. And yeah, you know, well, look at Nadia. Yeah, <laughs> so we certainly we certainly are open. Um, and and some of the topics that may perhaps you know uh, uh, heat up to a point where people will generally be climbing on each other. You know, in this platform, this gets dealt with 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 absolute uh, 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 clinical um, um, sanity. And 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 that's what we appreciate about each other as well. So so yeah, Ryan, uh, it's just a brief introduction, and then take us through your story. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, thanks for thanks for the forum or thanks for the platform. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in brevity, name is Ryan, uh, a new father. I have a son named Harvey who's nine months old, beautiful little boy. Um, from a work perspective, I'm a digital product owner at Unilever, um, and kind of my integration into Unilever was through Charlene. Um, she was the individual that actually hired me. So there's a backstory to that, but I'm not going to bore you with that right now. Um, and so, yeah, we, we kind of just fostered a real authentic and honest relationship. And so that has continued even past her sort of exit of, of Unilever. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a couple of disclaimers up front. Um, the story in particular is, is relatively candid. And I mean, for myself in particular, I am what I would like to believe is, is overly honest, vulnerable and transparent. So, I mean, I'm not necessarily going to hide or, or sort of not give you the full picture for fear of X, Y, and Z. So, um, yeah, I mean, just, uh, just acknowledging up front that this, this may seem a bit uncomfortable at points seeing as you don't necessarily know me, but, uh, I personally feel that in order for me to convey this message adequately, it needs to be in, in that sort of light. It needs to be authentic and honest. Um, Cool. So, oh, and apologies for the cap. I put on a collared shirt. Um, I mean, with a, with a young baby and uh, we're actually moving house at the moment. So everything is just an absolute mess. I said to Charlene, is this a video thing or can I hide behind the camera <laughs> behind the laptop? <laughs> um, she said, no, it's definitely video. So I said, look, apologies up front. I'm going to wear a cap. I won't have an opportunity to shower. Um, but it looks like a, a relatively informal crowd. Um, you look like good people. So yeah, cool. Um, so from a story perspective, I do have some notes down here. Uh, so if I do drop my gaze, it's primarily because I'm trying to ensure that I capture everything, but uh, I'll do my utmost to, to sort of focus on you opposed to the notes. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, ultimately my, my journey over the past eight months has shifted my my kind of perspective around masculinity and what it is to be a man um, ultimately because these nuances and societal understandings were were radically challenged um, to the point that I perpetuated behavior that was akin to society understanding and would have potentially caused um, sort of a negative impact to my overall health and uh, and so at that point where it really was a position of, do I choose what is societally correct or do I choose what is necessary for my health? Um, kind of brought about the discussion and understanding that I, I need to speak about this. I need to be more open around the entire sort of understanding of, of patriarchy, masculinity, what it is to be a man in, um, in sort of in, in society today. So let me give you a bit of context because I mean, kind of laid down a, uh, I don't know, a, a daunting sort of topic or, or title, but not necessarily given you context. So, so roughly about eight months ago, nine months ago, I had my, my son was born and there were obviously challenges and new sort of elements that, that cropped up. Um, and I think arrogantly, I, I assumed that there would be a very sort of easy transition. I would be able to manage and juggle everything. Um, I believe that I'm relatively good at taking on multiple responsibilities and uh, this would be the same. Um, long story short, I didn't, I didn't deal with it. I didn't deal with it well. I wasn't great with sort of the 
the work fatigue that was experienced, the lack of sleep, uh, there were sort of ill workplace dynamics that I wasn't equipped to manage adequately. And so ultimately it led me to a space of what I would now consider as burnout. Um, and, and so I, one of the reflections, so there's kind of two parts to the story and scenario. One of the reflections was that this entire process I didn't speak about. So I didn't tell my wife, I didn't speak to sort of work colleagues or friends. I told my, my boss at that time, half of probably the journey I was going through. And the overarching premise for why I didn't speak about it is because I believed that in this space, I am sort of the man, I'm the head of the house. Um, my wife was sort of battling through a bit of postpartum depression. And so in order for me to ensure that she was well, um, I should take on everything and therefore not, not share sort of the struggles and tribulations I was experiencing. Um, look, ultimately, in retrospect, I did that poorly and it, it did affect me from a mental perspective, which only at a later stage I was able to, to unpack and understand adequately. Um, and so, I mean, I guess at that, at that point was probably one of the first acknowledgements that I am obeying by a societal norm of what a man is opposed to being a human and being vulnerable in the moment and letting others in to sort of generate help and adoption where, where clearly I needed it. So, so that was kind of the first part. And now realistically, I didn't necessarily seek the adequate help or attention at that point because we, we kind of got through it. So it was a, it was a, a tumultuous period, but got through it. Um, and became sort of mentally well. And, and that was kind of the, the gist of it. 2020 came, um, I mean, obviously we all know the common narrative of coronavirus, lovely. Um, my son started to get his first teeth. So, you know, lockdown with a, a teething baby, whomever does know about that is not fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, but obviously I love my son more than anything on this earth. So one perseveres. Ultimately, um, Everything seemed to seem to be all right. I mean, I'd, I'd actually taken on a new role. So I'd moved myself from the environment, which I believed was toxic at that point. So taken sort of adequate proactive steps to get myself out of that workspace, um, which did, again, assist from a mental perspective. Uh, and so, I, you know, things, things were going well. Work was going well, enjoying what I'm currently doing. I mean, my, my background is theoretically industrial psychology, but... Um, I'm, I'm now building applications, websites, internal processes for Unilever and thoroughly enjoying it, enjoying sort of the shift. Um, and so uh, it was on, if I recall correctly, probably the 16th of April that, and this is where the disclaimer part comes in, so apologies up front, um, I noticed a lump on my left testicle. Um, and so didn't necessarily, you know, take heed of it at that point. It wasn't sore. It was relatively small in size, the lump, not the testicle. And um, that's my only joke, I promise. And so the, the, over, <laughs> the, um, the understanding again from sort of a, you know, in reflection from a societal male perspective was that, I mean, it's not sore. It's, uh, it, it, it's not really invasive. Um, sure, it probably shouldn't be there, but I'm sure it's nothing to, to worry about. And I mean, ultimately, there's a lot of things going on in that space. And so I need to proactively endure and take on burden um, to get through, you know, sort of this process. Even though in the back of my mind, I was slightly concerned that it might be something a bit more sinister. I kind of learned from my previous experience around not letting people in and not speaking through sort of elements of relative vulnerability to, to ascertain help. And so I told my wife and I said, look, I've noticed this. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about, but I am going to take sort of proactive steps to figure out what it is. Um, and, so, and so I phoned a friend uh, doctor and obviously because of you know, the lockdown, it, it is quite difficult to go in for, for certain sort of medical procedures. One needs to have a valid reason, obviously, to go for an ultrasound and things like that. Um, what, what did occur in, in that perspective was that I was given... Um, sort of immediate direction to go have an ultrasound to understand this um, adequately. And so I went for the ultrasound. Um, it was not conclusive as to what it was in particular. So I was sent to a urologist. The urologist had a look and again, couldn't conclusively determine what it was. I went for another ultrasound, still kind of on the fence as to whether it is uh, a cancerous tumor or if it is something that's not overtly sinister, which is common, by the way, for, for the men on the call. 
Um, and I, uh, yeah, I was recommended that we take worst case scenario in order to determine adequately what this is, because obviously we don't want to be in a position where it's not something uh, we we pretend that it's not something sinister, and then it does it does potentially evolve into something bad. Uh, so on the 24th of April, I, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Um, it was early stage, uh, so extremely grateful for that sort of prognosis. It was early stage. It was relatively um, non-invasive, so it hadn't permeated through some of the, the tissue uh, within the testicular sort of region. Um, and yeah, I mean, that was probably one of the most uh, sort of challenging times of my life. I can't imagine uh, previous to that, what sort of challenge I had faced. I mean, I'm a, uh, I'm a white male. Um, I've had many sort of overt blessings and I, I understand sort of the privilege that I am, you know, afforded because of my, my sort of race, culture and upbringing. So, I mean, challenges and, and sort of tribulations have been few and this was probably one of the most severe. I, uh, I am relatively optimistic and, and sort of led by sort of research and understanding. And so I, I did a bit of research around sort of the size of the tumor, uh, the staging, what is the sort of success rate around mortality, et cetera. And it all seemed to be relatively good. Um, but ultimately, I, yeah, I, I, I have cancer. Um, I am currently following sort of uh, cancer protocol. Um, I will be, I, I had a CT scan, I've gone through bloods. Um, fortunately, there was indication of no further spread. So uh, grateful in that perspective that um, there is acknowledgement around that per se, because obviously that would, that would permeate into sort of a, a higher staging in regards to the cancer. Um, I may still do chemotherapy, I may still do radiation, um, which is, is still up for debate and conversation because of the, the sort of space that we are in from a COVID perspective. And obviously that does lower your immunity and then puts you at further risk from, from a COVID space. Um, but the fact that it's not an immediate need is obviously indicative of where I'm at from a staging perspective. So, so I mean, ultimately grateful, ultimately grateful for, for that in particular. Um, I think there was, there was a couple of sort of points of, of reflection and, sort of epiphany moments and opportunity to to holistically reevaluate what was important to me at that point in time um, and then try to bring some sort of rationalization around how this had come to be so i mean if i if i think if i think about it and this is by no way scientific in its measure or understanding but ultimately i i'm a relatively healthy individual i don't smoke i drink on occasion um, I, I'm, I'm fit. So from a physiological perspective, it, it didn't seem like something like this would be afflict me. You know, I don't necessarily have those underlying elements. And so I kind of reflected on what had happened last year and how I'd internalized a lot of real stress um, and internalized them based on a patriarchal understanding of what it is to be a man. Um, and so in my opinion, that ultimately then divulged or manifested into something physical. Um, so for me, obviously, this is, this, like I said, is in no way ratified by, by science or research. But this, in my opinion, is, is, is what transpired. It, uh, it manifests out of my experiences the previous year. Um, look, I mean, I, I want to come back to the whole, the overarching point around, you know, why are we actually having this discussion? But if I may, there's, there's four points that I do want to sort of divulge and I'm kind of doing this where I do speak to create some sort of you know positivity and element around it so the one the one point is that I overly emulated what was societal view of being a man rather than just being human in both scenarios I chose to not speak up or get help during the end of last year I very nearly left the lump on my testicle because there was no pain and men shouldn't be concerned about about minor abnormalities right I learned from my previous experience that being vulnerable is key. I told my wife that I had found this lump and would be going for an ultrasound the next day. I sought help and, and support from friends and family. I cried twice. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable sharing this. So <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I cried twice. One when the realization during early diagnosis that I may not see my son grow up landed. Um, and when I was told there was no further spread in my body. I cried and ultimately I did not care who was around me. Um, wildly different emotions, but, but I cried. 
um, a real point of reflection over this entire sort of process is to live in the moment. Um, I kind of swore in my, my notes, but I'm not going to swear. <laughs> um, live in the moment because, I mean, work will not burn down if you decide to take a break. Um, certainly push for the right reasons, but do not compromise on your health for company benefit. That was an overt learning for me. Um, and then ultimately, I'm extremely grateful for my outcome and experience. Um, I want to be more. I want to do more. Uh, I'm not an entirely religious person, but this really did bring me back to some sort of understanding around faith and its acknowledgement within my life. I, I've always prayed. Um, I use prayer as a medium to be grateful. So uh, most evenings I would pray and I would, I would thank God for the opportunities that, that um, have been afforded to me. Um, this was obviously something different. I was praying for, for help. Um, but I did see that there was benefits in understanding that there's something more omnipotent than yourself. Um, and so I want to bring that back into my life. So those, those are kind of like the four, you know, sort of overt learnings or points. I think if we bring it back to sort of the topic at hand or, or the elements yeah. around sort of masculinity and, and sort of the societal understanding about men, I guess my, my view around it. Um, which is, you know, opinionated and, and sort of my own, is that I believe being a man is being human, ultimately. Um, I think that there is no stark sort of variance between what it is to be man versus woman. It, it ultimately is being, is being human. We, we cannot live this life without hardship, failure, and challenges. Um, and when I chose to be vulnerable, that was when I, I sought most power. That was when I, I, I was able to sort of thrive through opportunity of hardship and, and challenge. Um, and I mean, vulnerability is deemed as weakness um, from a societal perspective for men. And I, I chose to, to go against it and I'm, I'm grateful that I did. So, yeah, look, I mean, I know I have a couple, couple sort of elements around I, I overtly want to make myself available to anyone else that may go through something similar or is at a point of navigation and investigation on things they may not understand or know of. Um, not to say that I'll have the answer, but um, I, I want to be a thought partner, um, if at the very least. And so that's essentially what I'm extending myself to this forum, to whomever I do meet going forward. Um, I mean, ultimately, I just, I, I want to, I want to be more, I want to do more. And I would like to challenge what is the current narrative on being a man. Cool. Right. Wow. Um, thanks, uh, Ryan. That, 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 I, 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 I felt every word, um, um, except the fact that, you know, what, what really, you know, separates you and I right now is, is our appearance. But other than that, I think everything else is pretty much the same. I think um, we young fathers, you and I, um, we, we, we have almost, I mean, we're around the age, I mean, I'm not sure what your age is at the moment, but we're at the age where a lot of things are a touch and go, um, you know, getting to gripes with what you've been socialized to be like and what really your reality is calling you to be like. Um, so that whole balance uh, between, between how you are meant to be versus what you need to be. And, and, and there's generally a very big shift between having to, 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 um, to, take, to take yourself from a space where you've been told and you've been neurologically mapped to be a particular way than to suddenly now decide to be, especially for uh, um, uh, being, being, being a boy or being a man, where there's so much uh, pressure to be a particular thing. I guess women go through the same sort of, you know, uh, uh, social expectations of what they should be like. But I, I certainly would like to, 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 to come back to you um, uh, regarding these questions that are popping through right now. But we're gonna pause them at the moment because uh, uh, Temple, are you? Can you hear me? Temple. All right. I need a lot of permission from Temple, and I'm not sure. 
um, what's going on because he's logged on. He's just rushed Maybe back. He doesn't want to give you permission. <laughs> hey? Maybe he doesn't want to give you permission. No, no, no. I, I need permission from him to, to introduce his story because, I mean, he shared it with me and he shared it with a few people um, and, and it connects to Ryan's story. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and trust our, our rapport <laughs> and, uh, and, and go ahead and, and, and probably just introduce the subject. The reason why I asked him to come through today is because I did realize that Ryan is going to be sharing something that's very personal to him and something that, you know, uh, could potentially um, 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 create some vulnerability and fears around it. So I thought perhaps if we supplement uh, with Temple, because Temple Masofa I met a um, couple of months ago, and 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 I've spent some time with them. We actually went out uh, to some to some to a very nice place in Pumalanga called Dalstra, and we spent uh, a couple of days there with a group of other of our colleagues at the time. And and Temple um, actually survived uh, stomach cancer as well. A fairly young man with 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 a family, uh, two kids, a fairly young wife. And, and what I believe is a thriving career. And then boom, um, he has to go through chemo. He has to sit through um, um, uh, various uh, medical treatments uh, for him to, 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 to bet his way back into life. And, and, and I thought before we deal with the questions and start taking the, 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 the focus away from um, the, 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 the sickness and, and, and the cancer and all of that, which is, which is, which is perfectly understood and we are very compassionate uh, about. But this, the platform is, is, is connect to the future. And, and, and one of the things which we do here um, is that we interrogate how do we evolve as, as individuals from what we currently know and how we then connect it to what we believe we would ideally would like to be. So once he's done with the story, we'll then obviously direct all the questions um, um, it's a discussion once again. It's not going to be, you know, you run on the spot, and 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 I can sort of help. Uh, Seb, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Seb. And and Shalim, uh, if you need to go anywhere else, you're welcome to leave. Um, we did we did mention earlier on that um, we are going to uh, apply the necessary compassion to the subject. I guess uh, you know you know it's funny <laughs> because and I'm and I'm going to do this because. The, 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 the last time you guys went on for 45 minutes straight about marriage, I sat here and I kept quiet because I knew that I couldn't understand, I couldn't connect, and, and it was a female issue and we had to give it the time that it deserved for us to be able to, to get into grasp with what was being said. So I do, I do appeal for the, for the sensitivity once again today to say, yes, it may not be necessarily uh, a demographically a majority issue here, <laughs> but 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 I think all of us, um, yeah, I'm surprised all the boys are gone. Uh, 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 Molly said she's not coming through, uh, uh, Rai said he's not coming through, so it's just uh, myself, uh, as do. Uh, I think he went off anyway, so but, but that's not important. Uh, Temple, since you were able to come in, um, I just quickly preface uh, your story, and uh, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> the, 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 the permission from you to share it with, 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 with all of our friends. But um, I, I mean, trusting our rapport, <laughs> I, just, I just went on and briefed <laughs> the, the, the one thing no, that which we, the, the one thing that we're just talking about, Temple, is, is Ryan has just shared with us um, his perspective around what masculinity um, is for him uh, after having gone through the experience of... Um, um, uh, dealing with um, 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 uh, uh, some sort of cancer in his testicle, and 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 that's a perspective in which we're we're driving because we want to we want to really undress uh, some of these uh, uh, um, I'd say well somebody said social constructs and, and stuff like that which it really is but in this particular sense how we how we move ourselves from where we currently are to how we can potentially be as human beings ideally but please if you can just take us to your, through your story. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, apologies for being late. I was just driving uh, back from work, trying to rush back for this call. Um, so, yeah, um, I've, I've, I haven't really told the story much. Um, I think, Vincent, when you heard it, 
um, it was probably one of the first times that I'd obviously kind of told the story and, and, and really it was also, I think, a process for me to kind of relive the experience again uh, and try and make sense of it and, and kind of reestablish uh, what direction I needed to take. Um, but, you know, just to give a bit of background, uh, I'm, I'm a, well, uh, let me take you back two years which is when uh, this this story kind of unfolded. So I've you know ever since high school I've always been a, a very active person. I've always been engaged in sport, and even after high school in varsity, um, I played you know football. I went to back then it was Tuane Tec Technicon. Um, so I was always quite active. Um, and it's always been a big part of my life. Um, so fast forward a couple of years later, uh, I'm, I'm out of varsity, I'm working, I'm, I'm leading what seems to be like a normal life, like everybody else. Um, and, you know, part of my lifestyle would be, you know, going to the gym and just trying to stay fit since I can't play any active team sports uh, due to time constraints and just generally life. Um, so it, it's, it, it was always, you know, a, a, a constant in my life in terms of being active and, and kind of living that life. Um, and then uh, one of the, you know, hobbies that I have is that I actually um, instruct a few classes at Virgin Active, um, uh, you know, body conditioning, a heat class. Um, so it's part of my weekly weekly schedule that I present a couple of classes. And on this one Friday morning, I went into my session and um, five, minutes in, five minutes into the class, I really was just out of breath. I couldn't keep up. I didn't know what was going on. I was thinking, are my blood sugar levels low? Am I falling sick? I, I just didn't know what was happening. So... Um, I immediately just called in work and said, I, I'm not feeling well today. I'm not coming in. I'm going to go to the doctor and just kind of check this thing out and just kind of figure out what's happening. Um, got to the doctor. They did a, a blood test and they realized that my uh, red blood cells uh, were, the count was really low. So what red blood cells do in your body is that they transport oxygen to all your working muscles. So doing normal everyday activities, um, when you're healthy, you, you, you wouldn't realize it or, or, or notice any difference. But if, if, if that count is very low, uh, you would be out of breath uh, very quickly. Just going up a flight of stairs would feel like you just ran half a marathon. You, you literally could hear your heart beating in your head. And, and that's basically what happened in that session with myself. So that's what obviously prompted me to go to the doctor. And after doing that test, then I was told, hey, listen, you know, um, you have a low level of iron in your body. It's because you have a reduced number of red blood cells. So we're going to put you on a uh, iron supplement to try, obviously, restore the levels in your body. But at that point, the doctor wasn't really, it's a general, you know, practitioner. They, they weren't really interested in finding out what caused this, um, which is, you know, the crux of the whole story. Uh, anyway, we proceeded to treat the symptom, which was low blood, uh, you know, uh, iron levels. And I was put on a supplement for a couple of months, uh, which I took religiously. Uh, but the improvement, uh, you know, was really uh, minuscule. And um, the symptoms went from obviously just not being, you know, uh, fully energized as everybody else to, you know, uh, back pain, um, cramps now and then, um, an irritated bowel syndrome, uh, so to speak. And it got to a point where, I started, obviously, you know, as we all do, kind of self-diagnose. You go into the internet, you want to just search what the hell is going wrong, um, looking for answers, and you have a ton of questions. 
Um, and at the back of your mind, you, you also have this fear of just going for a full-on test and examination to, to really, you know, dive deep into your system to kind of really check what was happening. Um, so that process kind of unfolded for a while. You kind of try self-medicate, you buy over-the-counter medication and stuff to try deal with the symptoms that you're having. At the same time, you do obviously consult with the doctor uh, to deal with your low levels of iron, which is what I did. Um, so this started in October, fast forward, March, uh, the following year. Uh, I woke up this one Saturday morning. It was actually my wife's birthday on that day. And I was just in, in ridiculous amounts of pain. And I just woke up and drove straight to this camp to try to get painkillers, um, of which I did. I took, you know, these pills immediately as soon as they were dispensed. Um, and, and, and I thought I would have relief um within a couple of minutes as as per normal and that didn't happen so and something at the back of my mind told me something is is really really wrong so uh, i immediately knew that i needed to go to the hospital so I, I go back home and i actually start packing a bag i don't know why i packed a bag but something told me that i wasn't going to come back uh the evening back home you know so that's what i did um so wifey obviously drives me to the hospital. She's also a bit concerned, um, you know, and we get there and I'm in excruciating pain. Um, it's, you know, literally my abdomen felt like it was on fire, um, but not at a specific point. It was almost like the whole midsection was just in pain. So I get there, um, little company of Mary in Pretoria, um, get to casualties, get booked in, and immediately my my point was to just get pain relief. Uh, so they put me on a drip, and obviously I go through a series of tests. You know, they do scans, try to figure out what's happening. Um, and the scan, obviously, the first scan kind of comes back inconclusive, but they see something is there. They just can't make out what it is, and. Uh, so the doctor that's on, that's on shift says, listen, I need to, something is happening. I'm looking at the scan. Something is happening, but I, I can't, um, you know, make up what it is. So I'm going to send it to a colleague of mine who's also working. Uh, remember, this is a Saturday morning that this is taking uh, place. Um, and, and yeah, she says, I'm going to send it to a, a buddy of mine. Um, I want them, I want to get a second opinion of what I, I think I'm seeing. But I just want to get it verified. So this person obviously sends it through and it comes back later. The doctor saying, yeah, something hectic is happening. We don't know what it is, but I would suggest that the, the patient obviously remains. Uh, and then we send them for further scans. Uh, they, so they booked me for a CT scan for the following morning, of which I undergo that scan. Um, and then it, it actually proves that there's something happening. They see something in my... Uh, stomach, uh, what seems to be tumors, and they also notice that my liver is um, swollen. So there's inflammation that's taking place, but the the point of you know the, the, the where the the issues are you know originally uh, starting from is is my stomach, and it's obviously affecting everything else, um, which is what explained the pain, the terrible pain I was feeling. It's just the inflamed liver. Um, so, so that's the first somewhat of a diagnosis that I get that there's a problem in your stomach. We see almost like a solid mass of sorts and we see lesions on your liver. So we need to obviously now go inside and, and figure out what it is. So they booked me for a gastroscopy, which took place on the Monday evening at around seven. Um, this is when really you know, the shit hit the fan, so to speak. Um, so I go in for that procedure. They put you under, and obviously it takes about uh, 20 minutes for them to complete what they need to do, which is basically send a, a camera down your throat into your stomach and literally just look at what's happening in there. And then it was confirmed that obviously uh, there are tumors that, you know, have have started developing and 
I don't know how long they've been there for. They can't really give you that much detail either. But it's a it's it's one of those confirmations to say this is you know where the issues are starting, and we we realize that your liver is also involved. Um, and well, obviously, they, this, this is a, what, what's happening. While with me being under, I'm not part of the conversation at this point. So they complete the examination, and I come back. Um, so you you kind of wake up and you remember where you are, and uh, the nurses are like, you know, trying to get you back and checking if you are alert and you know you you're fully conscious and. And I was fine. I'm back. And then, so the first understanding of what's happening starts off with a doctor that just walks to my bedside. One of the doctors that did the examination walks to the bedside and says, um, says, how long have you had the, the tumors? And I didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, eh, excuse me? And he says, well, how long have you had the tumors? And I said, what tumors? And he says, well, we found tumors in your stomach. Um, so that's the reason why you've been in pain. That's, that's the reason why uh, you're here, essentially. So, and I just said, well, I didn't know I had tumors. And he says, yeah, well, it looks like you've got stomach, stomach cancer. Um, which was a shock, obviously, at that point. You know, this is not something you're expecting to hear. Um, I'm a 37-year-old, relatively fit uh, a young man who's got no family history of cancer. Um, on the mother's side and, the, you know, the father's side of the family, there's no family history, there's nothing. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, um, uh, there was nothing I could point to, um, you know, with regards to my life that, that was possibly the source of, of, of this issue. Um, and, and part of the process is you now obviously trying to pinpoint and find out where you possibly could have picked this thing up, uh, which is difficult to do. And the doctors themselves are not able to, to, to tell you that. Uh, they just give you a full-on diagnosis to say, this is what we found and you, you have to deal with it. Um, and, and the extent of, of these tumors um, at that specific point, it was so bad that one of the doctors literally just said to me, listen, uh, if I was you, I'd get my, uh, what did the, what, he, he used a specific term, but basically, you know, I'd, I'd get my, my stuff in order, you know, um, as, as if, you know, I, he was implying that I, I don't have much time, you know, uh, based on the discovery that they've made. So obviously in shock, you get taken back to your ward. Uh, you are alone when you obviously kind of get these news. Um, and then obviously you spend the evening alone. You're on the phone with the family later, but I didn't say anything much because I was still trying to make sense of it myself, uh, which was a Monday evening. The Tuesday, um, the wife comes over, obviously, to just visit as per normal. And I then kind of break the news to say, listen, um, this is what I was told the night before, but we're just waiting for a conclusive diagnosis. Uh, but there are tumors, um, they are cancerous, and you know, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's stomach cancer. So... We don't know how far along this is, what stage of it it is, but it, it is quite serious. Um, and it's quite a tough experience to kind of go through. Um, you know, you, you literally obviously just, it's a cliche, but your life really just flashes in front of your eyes and you kind of, mm. you know, look back and, you know, it's very difficult at, a, at that point to look, look forward and, and, and kind of picture anything because you, you just, you, you, you are just focused on the immediate issue. Um, but I know right then and then that I'd made a decision in my, in my mind that I wanted to fight this. I wanted to live. I wanted to, you know, uh, to not give up um, despite the, the current situation and the diagnosis. So 
we had to just wait another day for an official diagnosis from the physician that came through that was looking after my file and my um, my medical condition. So he came through and it was early in the morning. It was on the Wednesday morning and uh, yeah, he broke it down and, and gave it a specific name. And he said, unfortunately, from what we see, it's stage four cancer. Um, it's affecting the liver. Um, you know, which which creates further complications. Uh, but based on your file and looking at your medical history, uh, he said, well, I, I, I really believe that if we go for treatment, we can potentially beat this thing. You have a lot of reserves, uh, as he put it, uh, and you, you are relatively healthy. You've got no other underlying conditions. Everything else is, is perfect. Um, so to speak, so you have every ability to fight this thing if 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 you wanna you know go at it. And I said, well, that that's what I wanna I wanna do, you know. So, um, this was literally the the Wednesday before Good Friday, um, so it was very difficult to kind of deal with it. And and the immediate thing was that okay, we've managed to kind of control the pain, so we're gonna let you go home. Uh, for the long weekend and then as soon as obviously the office is um, open uh, we, we can speak to your medical aid get you know authorization to get you on treatment um, so this was an, I think the, the longest four or five days of my life because um, when you told such news and and you know in your head what you want to do you know what direction you you, you want to go into which was treatment. You, you want to start this treatment like yesterday, you know? Um, and yet, you know, you have to wait for this long weekend because offices are closed. There's, you know, a bit of inefficiency in the system given the fact that it's a long weekend. So nothing will get processed. Even if you get your paperwork sent through, it'll probably sit on someone's desk until probably the Tuesday. Yeah. So, Tabo, Tabo, yeah. Tabo, just before you continue, um, we've got about, say, another 15 15 minutes to go so we just we mm -hmm. just want to to spend some time reflecting on both the stories i mean it really is um quite big subject so 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 you can bring the matter to a close in the next couple of minutes and then and then we'll okay. head over to the questions here okay so so yeah so so the the long weekend obviously ends and uh, authorization gets approved and i start my chemo um obviously along the way uh, you obviously have to now break down the news to your parents who also are in shock when they hear it, uh, colleagues at work, uh, everyone basically that knows you, um, you know, who's close enough to, to, to you know, to, to know you well enough to, to be part of, hey, I need to break some news um, on my condition and what's happening. So, uh, so that happens. Um, I undergo chemo therapy, uh, which is really, really tough. It is everything that they say it is. Um, it literally just breaks you down, kills everything in your body, and just lets everything grow back again, and your system rebuilds itself. Um, so that was a tough process that I had to undergo. Um, I was literally off work for a good 10 months um, on my way of recovery, um, and, and it, it was a tough journey. It was literally tough. You, you, you go through... Oof, terrible evenings alone um, and, and at the same time you really don't want to worry and stress people around you so you you underplay the pain that you're going through and the discomfort and all of it uh, so that at least they can get a bit of rest themselves you know but everybody else around you is worried uh, I had two little kids um, at the time so you know so it, it was tough obviously being in a in a home and 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 you know having to kind of show strength at the same time, uh, dealing with this massive, massive challenge. But ultimately, uh, the process obviously um, took its course. And I stayed positive. I think throughout the whole entire process, the mental approach to it was, was the biggest part for me. Um, uh, I, I always stayed positive um, from the day I got the diagnosis. Um, and, and the recovery started obviously happening and, 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 and you know, I started feeling stronger. At the worst, I couldn't put on my own socks in terms of um, physical condition. 
Uh, you're so weak, just taking a shower just takes it out of you. Um, and you're not doing anything physical. You're just literally standing under, you know, running water. And it's so bad that you really need to take like 30 minutes to recover afterwards. So, yeah. So, so that whole entire experience um, ran its course. And I think by the 10th month, um, this thing was really just kind of uh, coming to an end. And, and my body was really now coming back, so to speak. And um, yeah, I was able to kind of get the condition to be stable, which is what it is. Uh, the tumors uh, in the system are still there, but they're not growing. Uh, they're actually getting smaller in size. Uh, I'm not having any, you know, debilitating symptoms that I'm dealing with on a daily, but I'm still on maintenance chemo. Um, and then I go for, for regular scans and, and, and blood work, um, which is pretty much, you know, it, it's, it's the story for the rest of, the, of my life going forward. You know, I, it's living with this thing that I have to manage and, and, and try obviously make better lifestyle decisions on, 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 on how do I keep myself healthy and, you know, try to live a more um, healthy life, really. So, yeah, it, it was a tough journey, but, you know, eventually I'm, I'm able to reintegrate back into normal life again, back at work, um, somewhat active again uh, with the things that, you know, um, were a big part of my life. So um, it, it's been really a tough journey. It, it, it's still a thing that's always back of your mind. Um, you're not necessarily free as much as the, the average person. Um, and your your mortality is, is really just you know, it's, it's put out there and, and you have to deal with it, you know. Uh, everybody who doesn't have anything kind of looming over their heads kind of lives with a certain attitude, you know. Tomorrow is always guaranteed um, and, you know, procrastination is always a thing. It's not even a thing to worry about. There's always another day. Uh, so this, for me, has changed my perspective on a lot of things and what I approach uh, mm -hmm. And what I deem important in my life. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, but yeah, okay. as I'm speaking to you right now, I'm 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 pretty okay. Um, uh, the prognosis has been great. Uh, the conditions are is, is stable, um, and it hasn't spread anywhere. Um, so yeah, we can only hope for the best. I think going for forward. Wow. Gee. Um... I, you know, I, I, at this moment, uh, it, it, it feels as though um, we just want to park it here and, and say our goodbyes because I, I, do, I do feel that each one of us are reflecting on Ryan's story and reflecting on Pepper's story at very different levels. Um, but, 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 I mean, in terms of understanding and connecting and the questions and the resonance, mm -hmm. You know, to the to the to the situation uh, that uh, both Ryan and yourself have gone through. But thank you very much once again, uh, Temple, for agreeing to do this. And Ryan, thank you for agreeing to do this. We just want to quickly um, connect to the future with this with this topic. And I know that it's it's personal story. It's not things that are thought about. It's not academic stuff. It's stuff that you've lived through. So so we're going to have to really be very um, a clinical uh, with how we, 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 we approach the subject because um, this, this, this obviously is a safe space. These, we all friends here. We all love each other. We all are compassionate with each other's situation. Uh, but, but, but it's just really um, just an extra layer of, of compassion to what we're talking about. But, but the, the, the title was Can Men Survive Patriarchy, right? Um, and and and, and perhaps, you know, this word has been bantered about a couple of times in society and a lot of people, uh, particularly Shaleen, is, uh, is an activist of, of anti-patriarchy there, you see right there at the back. And, 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 and what really is patriarchy is, is assuming uh, that, that a man is, is in society is, is a superman, right? Um, he gets everything, he gets the last day, um, he, he's entitled to everything. Uh, by just the, 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 natu the natural form of existing as a male just gives you these privileges right away. 
and and obviously in society it 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 gets it gets it gets better um, uh, in terms of privilege, you know, uh, depending on where you are in the world, uh, particularly for a man and the packing order of organizations, political organizations, corporate, uh, and on all sorts of stuff. You know, men men are generally at the top. But let's just let's just go to 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 these to these questions that started on about say half an hour ago, and and one of the things which Shaleen um, asked is that as someone currently working in healthcare sees this all the time where young men access healthcare through their partners, right? And I'm assuming that you're saying that they, uh, you might want to explain that because when you say they access healthcare through their partners, I'm not sure what it is that you mean. And then this is specifically in relation to HR, SRHR and HRV. The health problems they're related to their men parts. So my question here is really, why is this the case? Uh, um, ill health makes you weak uh, and that too ill health relating to your sexual part is out of the question so so just before just before we attempt to answer this um, uh, um, Shaleen what, what do you mean the excess health care to their partners so that I mean and why I followed that up with specifically sexual and reproductive health rights and HIV is that if your partner tests positive for HIV, you assume that you're HIV. I mean, test negative for HIV, you assume you're negative. If your partner doesn't have an STI and you send her um, as a heterosexual man, you send her to the clinic to check that she's fine and you assume you're also fine. Um, or even the, co the questions that come with living a healthy life are not often male problems. Um, and obviously this is not universal across all men. But if we look at a majority case scenario, um, you know, the assumption is if someone, if something's wrong with me, you know, the woman is going to tell me, do whatever. Um, and it's not X, but, but I mean it specifically around the sexual and reproductive health rights. I mean it around your man part and how this challenges, you know, um, your man. Look, um, uh, uh, we've got we've got Ryan, we've got Oli, Le, Toba, we've got we've got Seppo here on the line, and those are just about the only four men uh, who who can connect to some of these 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 questions. Um, so I, I'm 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 going to sh go ahead and, and answer specifically that that question um, and say that um, probably some someone here can relate better to the question, but certainly. Uh, I've never felt the need to to make my my health a a care for the next person. Um, um, certainly, from the time that I've grown up, we grew up uh, in the times where you get taught about HIV AIDS from a very young age. I knew about um, uh, condoms before I knew how to count up to ten. Uh, we were young when we were being taught about condoms and how to put it on, and so on and so forth. Then you grow up knowing the fact that. You know, there's something called HIV, there's something called AIDS, uh, there's something called uh, when you sleep with someone, you potentially could, you know, uh, contract HIV AIDS and sexual related, um, uh, or sexually, sexually transmitted diseases and all sorts of stuff. So, so I, 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 I don't know which men do that, but certainly I, uh, besides by being sort of prom promoted in carriage by the medical aid to take annual HIV AIDS test. Um, I make it a point that from partner to partner, if I do move uh, from one partner to the next, I do my own um, uh, healthcare checks to make sure that I don't come with things from previous relationships to the next. Um, I, I go through those counseling to, at the time that they used to do counseling these days, it's just really a rapid test. Um, and, and I've gone through all of that myself without having to rely on, on my partner to do that. So. So I don't know which men are these that do these type of things, but certainly if you're talking about it, it means that it actually is something that, you know, people do. Uh, does anyone have any story related to this particular question? It doesn't seem like there are men here who, who are irresponsible. Oh, yes, Mbali, carry on. <laughs> um, okay, based on obviously the forum that I work on, um, what Charlene is saying is actually true. Guys just generally are not proactive about their health 
they're not proactive about just knowing they are standing in terms of their health. And most of the time they will find out because the partner went, not because they on their own got up and went. Or like, for instance, um, a situation happens, which is now both in um, Ryan and Seppel's case, where something happened that then led them to go have a checkup. But on a normal day-to-day, you know, guy, the guys I know as well, they just, there's very few men that would be like you who are proactive to go just have themselves checked all the time. Um, and I think it's, it's just, it, it goes back to how boys are raised where as a, as a boy, you are told to handle pain. You know, um, I mean, if you listened to Ryan, you know, he just took it and he didn't want to show the painful side that he was going through. And that's generally how boys are raised and they take that up to manhood. And that is why they find themselves in the situations that they do, um, including then the partners that they are with at the time. That's just mm. also my experience. Mm. Mm. Okay. And, and, and just to, to move through to the next one, uh, and I, like, I, like, I would ask this question as well, because uh, I know that I am a very vulnerable uh, male. I mean, all my friends that know me, I... There's not, well, that's how my mom raised us between my sister and I. There was never boy or girl at home. There was never, oh, you clean that, you do that. If it was time to clean the stoop, you clean the stoop. If it was time to clean the yard, you clean that. It didn't, it didn't matter whether it was a girl or a boy. So I grew up without, um, with, with very limited consciousness of male and female stuff. But I mean, when, when, you, when you get news like this and you're a man and you're ahead of the household and you have that, I mean, it says, do, do, does that make you, feel any different from men receiving news like that? Do you, do you feel a great pressure to protect the mother, the partner, the children? Perhaps starting with you, Ryan. Um, yeah, so look, let me, let me just very briefly shift back to, to Charlene's initial question. And I mean, I think one, one, of, the, one of the levers in particular that um, I, I felt was that there, there is this overarching understanding of, of sort of immortality at a specific age. And I don't know if it's a male thing or an age thing, but I never, I never viewed mortality as a thing until there was potential that it might be taken away. Um, so, so that's one element. And then I think from a, from a reproductive perspective, it's also, I mean, I, it, it's potentially an egotistical view that as a male is inherent, but I mean, there's, there's acknowledgement of me not wanting to speak openly about the fact that I have one testicle to a forum of strangers. And then there's the other lens in that if I do not, and in some way within this group, someone else is afflicted by this and something negative happens because I was ingrained in my ego to not share, that would be devastating for me. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess there is, there, there's sort of like that male egotistical element that does perpetuate into, let me actually figure out what is wrong personally from a sort of reproductive health perspective. Sorry, I just wanted to shift back there. Then, then your, your initial question, I mean, I, um, I don't know if it's right. I don't know if it's wrong. I don't know if it's commonplace, but I, I felt that I, uh, I was kind of like, how, how do I, how do I share this news with my wife and family? opposed to let me just share the news. So there was, there was a thought around strategy to alleviate the perceived impact on my family and wife. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I mean, that, that, that definitely occurred for me. Yeah, Temple, did you, did you also feel like you can't really just divulge? I, I also heard you say that, you know, you had to call them, but, but you had to put up a story of some sort. <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's a tough one in that respect um it, you it, it's it's a really difficult position that you put it you know you put under um but i think deep down you just want to do the right thing and obviously uh having those kind of news that you need to share it, it really kind of makes you examine your life and kind of identify what who is really important um, and and yeah. and deserves to be told what's happening, 
um, and, and, and that becomes very easy once you, you establish that. And I think what also makes it easier to kind of um, be the bearer of the bad news is that you, you are the person who's affected the most. And already you've made a decision that, you know, you want to kind of fight this thing and you, you are positive about it. So um, it was tough, obviously, breaking the news because you know what, you know, effect it will have on the people that really care about you. Um, so, yeah, so, but, but eventually you do, you know, but you, 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 you really just become guarded about who you divulge this to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you want to keep, you want to keep um, a sense of strength with you um uh and and not just you know tell the whole world so to speak mm. Mm. So, so, so charlene i'm going to give you samples numbers and then you can ask these questions chairman because charlene is getting nervous hearing you talk about your symptoms and and she's going sort of i don't think she's going through exactly that you know she's probably yeah being, it's probably hypersensitive right now. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll give you a uh, sample of numbers and you guys can just chat offline and just make sure that, yeah, no that problem. you're okay. Yeah, no problem. Then, and, then, and then I think what is here is more, um, you know, comments of compassion than there are questions. Um, and, and perhaps I'm just going to read, well, all of them, I guess. Um, well, Bali said today was emotional. Thank you for this, Jen. Um, uh, Zanele says, Ryan and Seppo going through so much and still being this positive. You both are amazing. Thanks for sharing. Dumi says, uh, Ryan and Seppo, thank you for sharing. You brought us uh, a personal touch of our little world and brought us back to reality. And Nutana says, uh, thanks for incredible stories. Thank you for sharing. I'm a chronic procrastinator. You've opened my eyes to how I take my time here and earth, and earth for, 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 for oh, oh, time and health here on earth for granted. Uh, strength to you both. Uh, Naji, thank, Ryan and Seppo, thank you um, uh, for sharing. Take care. Um, a lot of health going into the future. Um, and then obviously, Oli Lena Sova is saying, thank you for sharing, Jen. You, you have my love and support. So, 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 so yeah, I guess, I, guess, I guess more than anything, you've empowered each and every one of us to, 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 to look into matters that perhaps you know, could be taken um, um, completely, you know, out of, out of context because of the remoteness of the subject. You hear about people on TV, you hear about people on papers and through friends and friends, but you're with here, we are we here with us, um, uh, you know, we, we, we are connected one, one, one way or the other, and we are probably two, two, two levels of connection uh, between each other, all of us, so it brings it much more closer. And, and I just want to also extend uh, gratitude as well, uh, from my side, for you guys uh, to to share your personal stories with us, and 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 I mean I'm happy you guys are well now. I mean Ryan, you 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 healthy, you back you you back on board. I mean Temple, I know you you, you skip like ten thousand skips a day now these days. So when you say, <laughs> I, I, I'm back, I'm back to my to my moderate whatever. I mean you you you're certainly doing way more than me uh, <laughs> at this moment. Uh, so, so yeah, thanks for joining and thanks for coming through, guys. Uh, we we will keep in touch. Um, uh, Ryan Temple, do you mind if this video goes up to YouTube at all? I, I don't mind at all, eh? Yeah. No. Right. Yeah. Okay. No problem. So 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 yeah, we, we we generally do that for our friends uh, who couldn't make it to the session just to to yeah. And I would actually encourage most of uh, the boys uh, to, to to actually go in and, and watch because we we take it for granted uh, and we think oh we have it all sorted. Uh, but I mean, I, I like I like what what Seppo said earlier on to say that the doctor said you've got some reserves. So what it means is that we still need to continue taking care of our health because now 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 if you need to do something that would uh, take completely away all your resources, you know, you may not even have a bit to even get into the door. So so yeah, um, it's really appreciated and thank you so much, Jen. Um, and and everyone else, uh, we meet next week. Uh, once again, Ryan, please come back next week. Tempo, if you have time, please come back next week. We don't, we don't yeah, know what's sure. going what's, what's to be spoken about next week. It's certainly not always as serious. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but I guess, uh, I guess uh, that the subject and, 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 and what we were talking about warrants that you know, we apply a bit of compassion as opposed to just chatting with uh, 
uh, about issues in a normal way that we generally would. But this is generally, you know, a very relaxed and we, we, we talk whatever crap and nonsense in between. So we'd love to see you once again. Uh, and to everyone else, thank you so much for joining and uh, we meet again next week. Cool. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. You.